It is a continuation of uh, what we said earlier. Namely, given a finite dimensional vector space, there is an intrinsic number associated with it called the dimension, which is the number of elements in a given basis. And mathematically, you see the relevance of the last theorem that we proved. We could not have made this definition if we had not proved that theorem. Okay. What did we prove there? He said that any two bases that you choose, they will have the same number of elements. Therefore, you see that irrespective of the choice of the basis, you are having a same number associated with the vector space. Okay. This is what you call the dimension. Now, one of the immediate consequences of that result is that if V is, is n dimensional, now by which I mean a basis consists of n vectors. So, this vector space will have a basis consisting of n vectors. Then every n plus 1 vector take any n plus 1 vectors in an n dimensional vector space, then it is linearly dependent. I think the proof is very trivial. Hmm? Just one step you can prove that. Okay. So, I, I, I do not want to do the proof of it. It is very simple. right? Now, we look at, so you see you may have several vector spaces of dimension n. Okay. Which is uh, over the same field when the field should remain the same if you want to compare two vector spaces you should keep the field the same otherwise there will be problems. So, what we are looking at is various vector spaces over the same field having dimension the same. Okay. In that case, uh, you compare them and are they identical in structure, abstractly are they the same? Now, these are the sort of questions that we are going to ask. Okay. This is carried in the, in the idea of the so called isomorphism theorem. Okay. So, before we come to isomorphism, we will look at the following. Consider P 2 R. What is P 2 R? All polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2 including 0. Okay. So, a typical member of P 2 R is P square, it is a typical member of that. And you know that if Q T is another member, then you have addition, scalar multiplication defined etcetera, etcetera, it forms a vector space. The 0 element is P t with P naught equal to 0, P 1 equal to 0, P 2 equal to 0. Okay. Now, P 2 is a vector space over R.
So naturally you ask the question, what, what can you say about the dimension of this space? How do you get that? You get it provided you are able to construct a basis for that. Okay? So we start constructing a basis. It's in this case, it is rather simple because you take 1 t t square p 2 r. Okay. Are they linearly independent? A linearly independent means you are taking a combination C naught into 1 plus C 2 t, C 1 t plus C 2 t square and you want this to be a the 0 polynomial and this is 0 if and only if C naught equal to C 1 equal to equal to all of them are 0. Because a polynomial is 0, a polynomial is a 0 polynomial if and only if all the coefficients are 0. So, we are making use of that and that proves that this is linearly independent. Okay? Now, you have to say that this spans the whole space, that is obvious because any member of this class is of this form and you can write it easily as p naught times 1 plus p 2 times p, p 1 times t plus p 2 times t square. Now, a small exercise in this direction would be the following, show that This is also another basis. How do you prove that? Prove that. So, for that, how do you check it? You have C naught times this plus C 1 times this plus C 2 times this you take okay? and set that equal to 0 polynomial. Okay? So, you would have C naught. identically equal to 0. This would mean what? So, you have C naught plus C 1 C naught T plus C 1 plus T square is identically equal to 0. That means, C naught plus C 1 is 0, C naught is 0 and C 1 plus C 2 is 0. So, C naught plus C 1 equal to 0, C naught equal to 0 implies C 1 is also equal to 0 and C 1 equal to 0 would and C 1 plus C 2 equal to 0 implies C 2 equal to 0. Therefore, you see that this is linearly independent. That is a simple computation. The second computation that you have to make is the following. Compute the following. That is find C naught C 1 C 2 such that such that G 
given polynomial so this is a given polynomial want to write this as a linear combination of this set of polynomials is it possible it's possible provided you can fix c0 c1 c2 so it leads to finding out c0 c1 c2 so what do you get in turn this is what you get c0 plus c1 equal to p0 c0 equal to p1 and c1 plus c2 equal to p2 so in terms of p0 p1 p2 you can uniquely compute c0 c1 c2 okay therefore every polynomial can be expressed as a linear combination of these three polynomials incidentally one of the results that you can prove is that once you have a basis the representation of a vector in terms of the basis is unique what do i mean by that so the representation so given a basis b the representation of any vector in terms of the basis this is one of the results that you can immediately prove why suppose you start with b b you can write as say c1 v1 cn vn that is one representation suppose there is another representation okay suppose b is also equal to d1 v1 plus pn then what do you have just subtract if you subtract you see that 0 is equal to and you know that this is the sum of these vectors is 0 it is linearly independent set therefore the coefficients are all zero so that means c1 equal to d1 c2 equal to d2 etc cn equal to dn therefore in terms of a basis you get a unique representation if you are see i said earlier that you can use a spanning set also to represent a vector space okay but then the representation that you get is not going to be unique that is one of the problems that you have okay for example take r3 in r3 take the set 1 0 0 1 1 2 3 suppose you take these four vectors certainly it is going to be linearly dependent okay but does it span the whole space you can actually see that it spans the whole space so if it is more than a basis now try to give a representation for an arbitrary vector in terms of these four 
vectors as a linear combination, it is possible. But now you see that the choice of the coefficients are not unique. You have a, a more than one way in which you can choose the coefficients so that you the combination, the linear combination is essentially the same vector. This will not happen with the basis. Okay? So, that is an ex, ex small exercise that you do, you will understand what exactly the meaning of this statement. Okay. Now, one thing that you have is that P2 has a basis 1 t t square, P2 also has a basis 1 plus t 1, 1 plus t square t square. You may have construct many more bases of this kind which will generate P2 and uh, what we have already seen is that this is a three dimensional space because no matter which basis you choose it has three elements. Therefore, it is a three dimensional vector space over R. Now, we try to do a small thing. So, we what we do is we take P P is a polynomial belonging to R. Now, you see that let us fix the basis. Let us fix the basis as 1 t t square. It is a basis for P2. Once you fix the basis, See, P can be mapped into R3. How do you map it? So, I will just put this in, I will put here 1, this with respect to this basis. Where does it go to? P is essentially equal to P naught into 1. t square. Okay. So, let me now write this as a ordered triple, I use the word ordered because that makes that has to be that is a caution there. I write this as P naught P 1 P 2 this belongs to R 3. I write it in this order not as P 1 P 2 P 0 because I keep this order 1 it is the p naught is the coefficient of 1, p 1 is the coefficient of t, p 2 is the coefficient of t square. Okay? So, let me write it this way. Now, this is an element of R 3. R 3 is also a 3 dimensional vector space over R. So, in some way R 3 is a replica of P 2. Okay. Why it is a replica of P 2? For the following reason, suppose you take two polynomials, take P and Q belonging to P 2 R. Okay. Right? And P plus Q Look at P plus Q. P is mapped to P naught, P 1, P 2. Q is identified with Q naught, Q 1, Q 2. Then you see that P plus Q is identified with P naught plus Q naught. P 1 plus P 2 plus Q 2. Am I right? Because you take the sum of these two polynomials can be written as P naught plus Q naught times 1 plus P 1 plus Q 1 times T plus P 2 plus Q 2 times T square. 
Therefore, our rule of identification immediately points you to P0 plus Q0, P1 plus Q1, P2 plus Q2, the triple. And that is nothing but in R3 the sum of these two vectors. Okay, you have already seen this. Okay. So, whenever you add two vectors in the polynomial space, there is the addition of the corresponding images here. Goes in the same way. Similarly, if you take a vector there, consider a scalar multiple of that, then the image of of the scal the, the, the scalar multiple of the image is the same as the image of the scalar multiple. Okay. Therefore, you see that structurally there is no difference between P2 and R3. Okay. This is what you mean by isomorphism. Right? So, this is not only an identification of see here you have you take a polynomial here there is a triple here. If you take any triple here there is a corresponding polynomial here. The sum of these two polynomials go to the sum of these two vectors and so on, scalar multiplication etcetera. So, you see that the mapping that you have defined here is a one to one mapping on to from P2 to R3. Not only that, it preserves the structure, sums are preserved, scalar multiples are also preserved. Okay. So, it is a structure preserving one to one non to map between the two spaces, this is what you call an isomorphism. Okay. Use the general term structure preserving, in the context of groups you say this, in the context of rings you say this, in the context of vector spaces you say this. Okay. So, whenever there is such a mapping, where the structure is preserved, and it is a one to one non to map, then there is nothing abstractly to distinguish between these two. Here there may be some set of objects, here it is another set of objects, but as far as the linear space properties are concerned, these two sets behave the same way. Okay. You call them by different names, yes that is there. Now, what you have to examine is this. Here you see that in this identification we have used 1 t t square. I said this is also a basis, this is also a basis. If you use this basis and use the same law, then you see it is not P naught, P 1, P 2 that is going to be the image, but the uh, the corresponding representation in terms of the new basis that you are going to have determine the image. Okay. So, what you have to prove is the following. It is the same sort of identification is possible with the choice of the ordered basis 1 plus t, 1 plus t square and t square, which needs little bit of computation. What do you have to compute? You have to compute what is the image of a p t with respect to 1 plus t, 1 plus t square, t square. Okay. Similarly, you compute a q t in terms of 1 plus t, 1 plus t square, t square. Okay. Then look at p plus q, find its image and then you see that the addition is preserved. Okay. So, also scalar multiplication is preserved. Not only that, this identification is also a one to one on to map. Okay. So, that is what you call an isomorphism. Therefore, what we have seen here is that P 2 is isomorphic to a copy of R 3. I am very careful there a copy of R 3. If I choose the ordered basis, I get another copy of R 3. Okay. A simple uh, example would work out. Okay, suppose you take 
take 1 plus t, take 1 plus t. What is the image of 1 plus t? You take the polynomial 1 plus t. What is the image of 1 plus t in terms of 1 t t square? It is going to be identified with 1, 1, 0. Okay. What is the identi identification of this with respect to? So, this is 1 t square. Here 1 plus t, 1 plus or uh, Suppose you choose this basis and what is the identification? The identification is going to be 1, 0, 0. Okay. So, the images are different the moment you change your ordered basis. Okay. So, an ordered basis, the choice of an ordered basis fixes an isomorphism and if you have an isomorphism, then it fixes a certain ordered basis. Okay. So, the two ideas are synonyms. The picture that you get is this. See, suppose this is B, a vector space and suppose V1, V2, etcetera, Vn is an ordered basis. Okay. Now, you can get a copy of f n, right. How do you associate, you use this idea in the general scenario, what do you do? Take a v here, now v can be written as x 1 v 1, x n v n, where x 1, x 2, etc., x n are uniquely determined. Since they are uniquely determined, now I can find a element here x, x is of the form the order n tuple x 1, x 2, etc., x n belonging to f n. No? Right? So, what I do is I map v to x, this I call phi. Okay. So, I write phi of v this is the definition, this is the definition of phi. Then what I can prove is phi of okay. phi is 1 to 1 phi is on to phi of u plus v phi u plus phi v then phi of k v k times phi v. This is something which I can right. So, phi is a 1 to 1 on to map, it also preserves the structure. So, structurally there is the uh, V and F n are the same. Suppose I were to use another basis, say u 1, u 2, etcetera, v m. Then this identifying vector x is going to be different, because in that case, my linear combination of the same V will be, suppose u n is the basis, is the ordered basis, then what will happen? Then the same V may get represented as y 1 y n u n then my identification of v is going to get mapped to so it's going to be another isomorphism that you would have 
Okay, right? So the i corresponding to every ordered basis that you choose for the space, there is an isomorphism between the vector space V and F n. Okay. Conversely, corresponding to every isomorphism between V and F n, you can generate a ordered basis. How do you generate that? For that, you observe the following. Phi of V 1 is what? Phi of V 1 is 1 okay? or more generally Phi of V i is going to be delta i n. So, that the ith element is 1, all others are 0. Okay? And this, this, this set of vectors we give a name. We usually use the word E 1 This is a standard basis for F n. No? It is a standard basis for F n where E i is delta i 1. I, you all know what delta i j is. Delta i j is equal to 0 whenever i is different from j equal to 1 whenever i equal to j. Okay? So, you get that. So, that will give you the standard basis. Okay? So, how do you get the basis for ordered basis for V which generates an isomorphism phi? What is given is phi now. So, what you do is pull back the vectors E 1, E 2, etcetera, E n. You know which is an ordered basis for F n. Okay? So, you define V i as phi inverse of E i because you know that phi is a 1 to 1 on to map. Therefore, phi inverse is also an on to 1, 1 to 1 on to map. Phi preserves linearity. You can also show that phi inverse also preserves linearity. So, phi inverse is an isomorphism from R n F n to V. Okay? So, use phi inverse. So, you take phi inverse of E 1, phi inverse of E 2, etcetera, phi inverse of E n. Okay? Show that if you define V i as phi inverse of E i, then V 1, V 2, etcetera, V n is an ordered basis that generates the isomorphism phi. What is given is the isomorphism. Start taking E 1, E 2, etcetera, E n, pull it back, you get a set of vectors here. Now, you want to assert that this is a basis which means two things are to be proved namely this is a linearly independent set and this is also a spanning set okay? which are quite straightforward to prove. I leave it to you. I do not want to go to the details. Hmm? It is a good exercise for you to do it, but you should necessarily do it. Okay? So, that forms a basis. So, what you see that when you have an isomorphism from V to F n, it maps an ordered basis to an ordered basis of that. By our definition of phi, it is the standard basis. Conversely, phi inverse will map the standard basis to a basis here and that's, that can be used as ordered basis which generates the particular 
phi. Okay. So, this is the connection between the isomorphism and the ordered basis. Okay. So, the theorem that we have is that V is isomorphic to So, every phi is determined by an order choice of an ordered basis, every choice of an ordered basis determines a isomorphism okay? and every isomorphism you can identify with a choice of a ordered basis, this is what you have. The mode of proving it is what I have done there. So, this proves the theorem, right. Now, you can stretch this a bit further to what suppose u and v are n dimensional vector. Spaces over over F, then U and V are isomorphic to one another. would you prove this? You can take a two stage work namely what do you do? See start with u, okay. u is isomorphic to a copy of f n. Okay. So, that means there is an isomorphism from here to here as we have set it up. Choose an ordered basis here that immediately defines the isomorphism. Similarly, you have V. V is isomorphic to F n. Okay. That means, psi inverse is an isomorphism from f n to v. Okay. Psi inverse is an isomorphism from f n to v. Therefore, now what is the isomorphism from u to v in terms of phi and psi? It is going to be psi inverse composition phi. Okay. You know that the composition of two isomorphisms is an isomorphism. Use that. In fact, that is how you prove the theorem or you can directly uh, uh, you know make this suppress this thing and then write a proof you choose an ordered basis here you choose an ordered basis here and then define a map from here to here by connecting the two ordered bases as we did in the other case but again in the working you will somehow bring in this fn into the picture to identify the right kind of element because what you do is start with a u, u is written as x1 u1 plus x2 u2 plus etc x and u n. Then how do you identify the element in v here? 
you will write x1 v1 plus x2 v2 plus etc xn vn as identifying v so u is identified with v so this so in between you are actually using that role of fn okay right so every n dimensional vector space over a field is isomorphic to every other n dimensional vector space over the same field if you change the field then the story is different for instance you know that c is a one dimensional vector space over the field c but c is a two dimensional vector space over the field r okay so the two cannot be isomorphic if two spaces are isomorphic then they have the same dimension okay so that is the isomorphism theorem which is at the back of the rest of all the things that we are going to do okay several images of or several copies of fn can be created isomorphic to a given vector space we see that we can use any one of these manifestation to serve our purpose and you see that this this uh, possibility it's a you know it's a very not a very pleasant thing that if you have too many things to be to be identified with one then which one you choose there's always a problem of plenty even but then you can take it make it as an advantage okay so the rest of whatever you do in linear spaces is going to be based on this availability of plenty of copies okay like the representation of a linear transformation etc etc that we come across use matrices and matrix representation of linear transformations with reference to different bases is going to be different Okay, so it leads to a lot of interesting questions later. So this availability of plenty is what we are going to exploit for the for building up a theory of linear transformations later. Thank you.